All right, I'm hitting record now. Hey, everyone, welcome back. Good to see you. We're doing something a little different today. Uh, so as of this recording, we just found out that the president and first lady have coronavirus, and that's not at all what we're going to talk about because that's not the point of this episode. I was not um, aware of that. Oh, no kidding? <laughs> yeah. Yep. That's, uh, they tested positive last night. So anyway, um, hopefully they're staying positive. Just kidding. It's a joke. Uh, so regardless, what we're doing today is going to have a conversation with uh, Vesper Stamper. She's an artist, an illustrator, a historian in a lot of ways. Would you say that? Is that correct? Like definitely a historian? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not trained as a historian, but I write historical fiction. So I, I am a historical researcher, but sure, can't man, claim. Would you say like, you can be like an autodidact, right? Like, and, and say like, okay, I self- self-taught enough like you feel comfortable talking sure. about the history you feel comfortable talking about yes right? so, I, I i'm as i'm as rigorous of a researcher as i possibly can be in my situation there you go all right so so she's a historian i'm gonna say it. she will say it i'll say it. she's a historian in a lot of ways an artist uh, a really interesting thinker um and so we're gonna be talking about her kind of some of her other books that she's written so her the one she just wrote, or not just wrote, that just came out, it's called A Cloud of Outrageous Blue. Uh, it takes place uh, during uh, the Black Plague, basically, 1300s, right? The Black Plague, the Black Death. And her one before that was called What the Night Sings. Uh, it takes place during the Holocaust. A uh, really kind of interesting book. And her next one is going to be taking place around the building of the Berlin Wall, if I understood you correctly. That That's right? right. 1961 Berlin. 1961 Berlin. She's also uh, does some illustration. You, I remember in one of your podcasts, you mentioned, I think it was a Jane Austen, a book of illustrations of a Jane Austen. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. That comes out next year. It's a, a picture book biography of Jane Austen for elementary school kids. Very cool. Really fun. So, yeah. so she's got a lot of really neat kind of works all over the place. Um, so we're going to talk about art, talking about history um, and a few other things and how kind of her field of expertise um, we can see it, the impact and the importance in history, and then also right now and going forward, hopefully as well. Um, so Vesper, welcome. Welcome. Good to see you. Did I miss anything, Thanks. by the way, in the intro? No, it's good. So, sorry to hijack your introduction. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm ready for our chat. I'm excited. Okay. No, no you didn't hijack anything. Uh, I want to <laughs> start with, um, I wanted to share something with you. So I was thinking about this and you know, there's so many different angles. You know, I showed you my collage of post-it notes I've written over the past few days when thinking about what we're going to talk about. And, you know, whenever we spoke, I think it was maybe last week or something um, before when we were kind of planning to do this, you know, we had talked about, you know, the importance of kind of art and at being an artist as part of your identity uh, in many ways. And so one of the things on my mind and we talked about then, and as I was thinking about going forward is, you know, we can lean into that and talk about it. And also like the ways in which that's unique to you. And then the ways in which art kind of connects with everyone in a lot of ways, um, you know, and how it's kind of a universal language. And one of the things that popped into my head was uh, this really short poem that I remember hearing maybe about a decade ago. Um, and I was wondering if I could kind of share it with you and kind of yeah. where I first heard it and, and use that as maybe a jumping off point. Great. Um, so the poem is called The Place I Want to Get Back to by Mary Oliver, uh, and it goes like this. <clears throat> the place I want to get back to is where, in the pine woods, in the moments between the darkness and the first light, two deer came walking down the hill, and when they saw me, they said to each other, okay, this one is okay. Let's see who she is and why she's sitting on the ground like that, so quiet as if asleep or in a dream, but anyway, harmless. And so they came on their slender legs and gazed upon me, not unlike the way I go out to the dunes and look and look and look into the faces of the flowers. And then one of them leaned forward and nuzzled my hand. And what came, or, and what can my life bring to me that could exceed that brief moment? For 20 years, I've gone every day to the same woods not waiting exactly, just lingering. Such gifts bestowed can't be repeated. If you want to talk about this, come to visit. I live in the house near the corner, 
which I have named Gratitude. And the first time I, I heard that poem was in the context of, so, it's, you know, it's, I, I, I think it's kind of a beautiful poem, very simple. And one of my favorite theologians actually used that poem as a jumping off point before he did a really long series about uh, some of the most important, like, theological doctrines to him. And he didn't start with a verse. He didn't start with a, a personal anecdote. He started with a poem by some random person about this experience uh, that they had, you know, or at least that's what the poem's about. And the point is, is that he was connecting the, that idea of gratitude that is expressed in that poem to how he felt about some of these theological doctrines. And there's lots of places that he could have went to in the Bible to try and express that, but he chose this piece of art, you know, these words, uh, this poem. So I was wondering if you could kind of speak to that of the way in which art um, just taps into certain feelings, certain emotions, uh, and communicates things in a way that really is unique to how each person experiences it quite often. Like I could read that to a, a bajillion people and it's not, some are going to go, that's stupid. Some are going to go, that's really cool. Some are going to go, I don't get it. Um, but regardless, their art does have kind of a way in which it taps into feelings and emotions and um, perspectives that really there's nothing else that does it like that. So I was wondering if you could kind of speak to that from your personal experience, anything like that, or, or just that poem itself, I don't know. Well, uh, I mean, that poem is a mic drop completely. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm sitting here like actually so moved by that poem that I, you know, it's hard for me to know how to exactly respond also because I, I'm looking out my studio window right now at Pine Woods, mm. where we back up onto like nine acres where there's like a herd of deer that comes through. And so sometimes I'll, I'll watch the deer go by as I'm, as I'm working and I've had connection points like that, N not nuzzling my hand. I don't get, you know, they don't get that close to me, but where um, you know, they're simultaneously the most destructive like they've eaten everything I've ever tried to plant until this year when we put a fence around a garden and like now it's, you know, surviving, but, um, being, you know, so, so that moment that she describes about the deer coming and, and, and having this, almost this dialogue with the deer, like it's a singular experience, but we kind of all know what she's talking about right? Like I've had moments like that with birds too, where like I'll be under a tree and a bird will be like, like this close to me, you know? And, and there's a moment where that, that wild thing feels safe around you and you, you feel like, oh, there, there's almost like, this is how, this is how it's supposed to be. Where almost like this Edenic kind of call, right? Where you, you know how the world is supposed to be when it's right. Hmm. And that's where you're, you're, you're at peace. You're so at peace with yourself and with the world around you that the wild things can get close to you. And I actually wrote a song about that like a, a number of years ago. And um, so, okay. So first of all, that, that singular experience, like um, as a writer, and as an artist, um, and especially as a writer of historical fiction, what I'm trying to do is to take the singular experience to communicate things that are universal. Hmm. You know what I mean? Yep. So if you start from a place of like, oh, I'm going to tell the universal story. I'm going to, I'm going to like, I'm going to write a story about the hero's journey. You're going to write the worst story possible. It's just, it's going to flop. It's going to seem didactic. You know, it's going to seem like, you know, like a moralizing tale. But if you, if you just tell the story of people, then the universal happens, you know, people feel that connection to, to that, to those universal truths. And that poem really captures that perfectly, you know? Yep. Yeah. I, it's, it's weird how, so I think I told you this <clears throat> when we spoke last time, but uh, the, the art that I kind of most connect to is 
uh, stand-up comedy and comedy generally. Yeah. And one of the things that I mentioned there is, is in that special, that talking funny one where Jerry Seinfeld talks about um, taking an idea and whenever he's crafting a joke and just setting it on the table, you know, he's like, you know, what, maybe you're making a joke about shampoo and it's just beating the heck out of it and looking at it from all these different angles to understand it until you really feel like you've exhausted it. And so, and make, and then communicating that in a way that people, you know, kind of understand. Right. Mm -hmm. And it seems like that is kind of that, uh, that theme of taking a concept and making it universal, you know, through your storytelling, through your art, you know, exists in, I mean, that exists in song that exists in, uh, you know, it's a spoken word and so on and so on. Not that the song isn't that, but you know what I mean? Like the different expressions mm -hmm. of creativity that we would call art. Now, one yeah. thing I wanted to uh, kind of pick up on uh, from what you just said there to kind of bring it a little bit back to your biography. So you said as a writer and as an artist, but, my, but from what I understand, you, you began as an illustrator, right? Like that's what yeah. your training was in. And so you, then you yeah. made a shift from just doing illustration to writing to now where it's just really natural for you to subconsciously say as a writer and as, you know, an artist. And I assume you mean like illustrator there a little bit, uh, maybe not, but either way, how did that happen? What was that shift like for you? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, what, tell me about yeah. that. Well, when I say artist, I really am talking about something encompassing all of the arts. Um, and I'm also talking about a way of being and a way of thinking. So, um, I don't differentiate, uh, writing is an art form, just like illustration, you know, painting or dance or, or comedy. These are all art forms. And so I would consider, you know, Dave Chappelle just as much of an artist as, you know, Da Vinci. Yep. They're just different forms. And so for me, um, so, okay. So I've always been a multidisciplinary artist. Um, before I became a writer, before I decided or before long form, you know, fiction fell into my universe. Um, I was a songwriter, a singer songwriter. Whoa. And I did, I uh, yeah. And I did that at the same time as I was doing illustration. I had, I had a dual career and the only reason I don't do the music anymore is because um, I had a car accident. And so the guitar behind me is, it's largely ornamental. <laughs> It's, it's just reminding me that that is, it's not dead. It's, um, you know, please God may, I, you know, go back to it at some point, but dormant. So it's dormant. It's dormant. So, um, so I've always kind of like gone, you know, floated back and forth between different disciplines. I I've also danced, uh, you know, um, so not well, not well, but so you're an yeah. artistic polymath in a lot of ways here. It sounds like, uh, you know, I don't, I, that's for anybody else to judge, I guess. Well, I just did. Okay. <laughs> well, you, well, you haven't seen me dance. So, um, but anyway, uh, so, so writing kind of came to me, writing came to me like in a moment actually when I was drawing a character on a, on a, at a New Year's Eve party. And it was the first time that I ever felt like one of the characters I had drawn had a story behind it that wasn't somebody else's story that I was trying to corral into, um, something marketable, you know, because I am trained as a commercial artist. I'm trained as an illustrator. And so I think, I think communication, I think audience, I think communicating a concept. I'm not, um, despite, you know, these attempts here at these abstract landscapes, I'm not an abstract artist. You know, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to distill down, you know, the, the, inf the information and the, the stimulus that I receive and to metabolize it for, um, for others to consume, not just consume, but it, but interact with. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think I lost the, I think you lost your original question, but. Oh no. My original question was just about how you made the shift from. Oh, well, how I made the shift. To, yeah. To writer. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I think that the way I see it is that because my novels are illustrated, which is a little bit unusual, it's not a graphic novel format that I do. I do an illustrated novel, fully illustrated, full color novels um that some of the passages in the book have to be painted with paint and some of the passages have to be painted with words they're they're just two different forms of telling yeah. the story yeah. and to my mind 
I mean, people have asked me, do you think you could ever just write a novel without illustrations? I mean, maybe if that's what the, if that's what the story called for, but I, it's just so much part of me to tell stories with pictures because I think the, there, there's kind of a rule with writing that is called, you know, they say show, don't tell, right? So if you're going to just, if you're going to write a passage about a character's emotional state, that's really, really hard to do with words without sounding like purple prose, you know, without sounding a little bit cheesy. Sanitized, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's better to just like describe what's happening around them, kind of maybe the actions, like maybe the person like, you know, absentmindedly picks up a, you know, a, a memento or something like that and holds it and looks at it. And that might give you a little bit of a clue to their emotional state. But to me, my illustrations are depicting the emotional state of the character and the, like the inner world and even the metaphysical world of that character in that moment in a way that I don't think would be appropriate to try to paint with words, mm. if that makes sense. It does. So for me, they really go hand in hand. It sounds kind of like uh, what's, so I'm going to, I'm going to butcher this and I don't even know who, who said it. Um, I think it actually, it might've been attributed to Da Vinci. I don't know, but the, um, yeah. Who, who made the thinker? Rodin. Rodin. Dude, that was in my head. And I'm like, that's not right. That's not right. That's not right. Any, okay. Anyway. It's Rodin. Yeah. But the, the quote was something like, you know, I, I started carved everything that wasn't it. And then what was left was it, you know, you stick. Well, that was Michelangelo. Off. That was Michelangelo. Yeah. Yeah. Right. right. But, but the Michelangelo idea, said that, but the idea is, yeah, is that you really, you're letting the idea kind of manifest as you go and you know yeah. when it's, it's there, but you don't necessarily know like until, until it's there. Kind of until thing. it's there. So for, and so mm -hmm. for you, part of carving, you know, the marble away is that's going to be some paint. That's going to be some words. That's going to be this, you know, and so does that make sense? So yeah, totally. And it, manifest yeah. as is appropriate. Yeah. And in fact, I was in this, to this spot yesterday because the la I, I've started a new book and the last month has been all of the, like, it, I've been trying to major on the research, on the world building, on like watching tons and tons of films, um, you know, collecting research books, all of this kind of stuff. And then yesterday was my deadline to start the actual drafting of the, you know, of the story. Yep. And so, you know, I sat down like, you know, at the computer and uh, like looked through, like I, I keep, a, you know, notebooks full of little jotted things and like, you know, trying to think, okay, well, like what is, what has coalesced over the, this month that has, you know, presented itself to me in front of me, like this block of marble. Right. And so, you know, I'm sitting down at my laptop and I'm like, oh gosh, you know, okay, where's the story going to go? And all of a sudden it comes to me, the family's out to dinner. Hmm. And then what does that mean that this, that this particular family is out to dinner? Well, they're poor, but they go to a fancy restaurant. Why? Because he just, the father just got like a one little job, you know, and instead of saving that money, he took his family out to dinner. And what are the dynamics there? Does it bless the family? Does it cause strife? Does it cause division? Anyway, so, um, so as I wrote that, it just, there's that moment where it's just like, you see it fully formed in your mind and it's just about channeling it out onto the page messily, totally messily. Like it's not going to make any, that's not the version that people are going to read. You just, you have to just get it out of your body and of your brain onto the page and that's it. Mm -hmm. And then later on, so that, so that's, you know, if you're sculpting, you don't go in and sculpt the nose right away. You know, you're going to do a, a rough block cutaway to reveal, you know, the essential form of the thing. You know, you're going to cut away those things and then slowly you're going to cut away everything that's not, you know, the eyelid. And it, so it's a very similar process. Yeah, that's uh, Nassim Taleb, via negativa, remove everything that it isn't and what remains is what it is. Mm -hmm. um, so, all right, so I want to, I have another question and then kind of use that as a transition into 
some of the stuff specific, especially to the most recent book, but yeah, jump off into the other stuff. In one of the episodes of your podcast, I was listening to you talked and it was just a really brief snippet, but you kind of hinted at it or you touched on it, you know, earlier whenever we were talking, but this idea of being in nature and you were talking about how at the beginning of, in the episode I was listening to, at the beginning of the lockdowns and stuff, you're doing some gardening and there was some utilitarian purposes there, but also you were finding that uh, it was a place to kind of center yourself and really, you know, collect your thoughts and be thinking. And so thinking about like the evolution of art, you know, and how really as humanity has progressed, we've moved more and more from the natural to the unnatural, right? So of course, early art is going to be rooted in the natural and in the, in the, our experiences in nature. Uh, you know, one thing I think that is, again, universal for most people is that they find like getting outside somewhere or at least where they can see outside somewhere, but that there's something about the natural world that inspires, that calms, that um, humbles and can draw out some of that creativity and help us to kind of, you know, peel back the things that are keeping us from some of those, you know, that inspirational thoughts and stuff. Um, and so I was wondering if you could kind of touch on, you know, whether it's, of course, historically that makes sense, right? Because again, that it, that's all you have is the natural world. But even now, that's still a thing that is, you know, where when people, you know, what's kind of that picture of, uh, whenever a writer is trying to get over writer's block, you know, it's this trope in movies as they go and rent a cabin somewhere in the middle of nowhere so they can be isolated, but also they're out in nature to get some inspiration, you know, and in, in movies, the, the trope is this artist is sitting underneath the tree on campus or they're out in Central Park or something like they're still fine. Like that can, there is something about that natural experience that does inspire or at the very least centers someone so that they can work. Like it's not that they have to look around for inspiration, but it allows them to be inspired, even if that's an internally generated inspiration. Um, what are your thoughts on just the way that nature all throughout human history plays such an integral role on the artistic process, the creative process, um, you know, from any perspective? Well, the thing that comes to mind first is this book by Gary Thomas called Sacred Pathways. And in that he talks about spiritual personalities in in terms of um, how how different people, how individuals feel most connected to God, you know, uh, and uh, so for some, that's theology, that's like reading, studying, you know, they feel really, really connected that way. For some people, it's uh, the contemplative, like, you know, or, or through like liturgy or things like that. For some people, it's nature. And I, th I kind of thought, oh, well, yeah, I've always wanted to live in the woods and, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a city girl. I'm like third generation New Yorker, but I would always just like long for this, like, oh God, I have to live somewhere green, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, in reading that book, I learned that actually nature is not, it, that it's not exactly it. Like my mother-in-law, she can look at a picture of like a beautiful tropical fish and she's just like moved, you know, like like move to tears over like, you know, this beauty, right? That's not me actually. Um, what I learned in that book was that for me, it's the senses. So I'm more of a, a like a sensate. And what I notice and, and the, the thing that trips me up the most when I'm trying to focus on my work is if I, if I'm not in a situation that is, I don't need a lot. I see. Okay. So I don't need a lot of quiet because I'm an extrovert. I actually do really, really well when I'm working around people. Hmm. So I, I write a lot at cafes, you know, before lockdown, that was the case, you know, I, that was my favorite place to write because, you know, I didn't have the distraction of everything that was around me in my house. I could go, you know, sit at a table with, with a coffee and just write. It's a little bit different with illustration. It's just impractical, but that subject of distraction is the thing for me. It's like, because, and this is something that I talk about on my podcast often is that artists, you know, by nature, we are sensory, like everybody is sensory, right? But artists um, have like a specific pathway through the senses 
where we, we're, we're creating out of the things that hit our bodies, you know? And so I think, I, I think nature is one of those things where, okay, let, let's scroll back here. So this whole thing that we're doing right now um, with our technology, with our Zoom call, um, you know, the ways that we've gotten through quarantine, right? Like Netflix and, you know, these are all... Tiger King. <laughs> what? Tiger King. Tiger King. Oh my gosh. That Right. Remember when that was like the big thing? So... I've kind of all I've kind of said for a number of years now, like the best thing that could possibly happen to us as a civilization would be a nice big EMP. Mm. Like if something would just come and fry all of the technology, we'd probably get we there would probably be some blood and gore for a little while, but we'd eventually find our our way back to our humanity. And um I think it's because this thing that we're doing right now is just this, it's, it's an experiment and it's something that is detaching us from our humanness. Mm -hmm. So just to bring it down to a little bit more granular level, like for artists is that, um, so I went back to grad school in 2014, 2016. And this is when like the iPad pro came out and a lot of people were doing their illustrations on the iPad and they were like, oh, finally, we're freed from all of our materials and we can like, you know, we can work on the subway. And, you know, and I'm thinking to myself, well, the subway is like where I get all my thinking done. <laughs> you know? Like that's where I like read or like chill, you know, because I can't break out all my materials. Like that's mm-hmm. where I don't, I don't want to work on the subway. I want to think on the subway. And so now we've like given ourselves these materials where we have no excuse but to be working all the time and 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 forcing all this stuff out of us, right? Like it's just all output all the time. And the input that comes into us is not human input. It's not sensory input. So one of the things that I really advocate for is like, even if you're now I work in Photoshop, like I, you know, I would consider myself a Photoshop expert, like, okay. So, um, but I have to just for the sake of my, my connection to my craft and my connection to my own soul, I have to, you know, I have to hold a paintbrush Hmm. and I have to have paint and materials around me because I need that feeling of like, I'm connected to the world that I'm trying to tell a story about. Do you know what I mean? So I think that's, you know, I think like the more that we can do that's analog and that is like rehumanizing us, whether it's as artists or just generally as people, what that does too is that it reminds us that we're in a world of other people. We're in a world of humans where, you know, even on something like this, where like, I'm happy that we're able to connect across these many miles, but God, it'd be so much better if we were in a room together, wouldn't it? Yep. You know? And so I think, I think nature, you know, like connecting to nature and working in nature, it, it connects us to other people in a way that is really, really important. Yeah. Well, and, and not just other people, but just anything outside of ourselves, right? Oh, uh, reality itself. Precisely. One thing, so it was funny, you were talking about working in the cafe and being around people because you're an extrovert. You know, one of the best explanations of the differences between extroverts and introverts I've ever heard that has always stuck with me is that it's not a matter of liking people and not liking people. It's a matter of what is costly to you. So if you're an introvert, it's costly for you to be around people. If you're an extrovert, it re- it's refreshing. It replenishes, replenishes yeah. you around people. Because I found that I do generally like to be around people, but it's costly to me. So whenever I would tell people I'm actually re- very introverted, they would say, that's stupid. That doesn't make any sense. You know, you can talk for days. Like, yeah, that's fine, but it's costly to me. And so I have to, if I'm, if I spend a lot of time where I don't get like any time by myself or anything like that, I become an entirely different person because it's so mm-hmm. exhausting on me mentally. So it makes sense that the That's interesting. In the cafe would be um, refreshing for you and kind of invigorating in a way. What, now, one thing I was thinking about with the nature thing, and this kind of leads into the book right now, Cloud of Outrageous Blue, is that you're talking about how, you know, your mom can look at a fish and it kind of elicits wonder right? And you were saying, well, that's not me. And the thought I had was, you know, I think nature elicits a lot of emotions, 
but it, it does elicit emotions. And, you know, I was thinking about how um, it can elicit wonder. It can elicit curiosity. Curiosity is the thing we've lost, I think, in a lot of ways. Yeah. You know, think about what you're just talking about. Um, and, and it elicits humility, you know, depending on, you know, your experience and where you're at. You know, I've spent a lot of time, you know, in the mountains and, you know, doing some, you know, potentially dangerous kind of climbing and hiking around and, you know, being out in the middle of nowhere. And there is a certain humility that you experience when you, whenever you see that, whenever you're standing at the foot of a mountain and it's there, you know, whether you like it or not, there's nothing you can do about it, you know, or whenever you're at the top of that mountain and you fought your way up there, but you know that like at any given moment, any misstep and you're, you're dead. Um, And so I think that in nature and just being out in something bigger than ourselves elicits a lot of different feelings for a lot of different people, but regardless, it does tap into something really visceral and that, that kind of humility. So your book, a cloud of outrageous blue takes place during the black death, the plague, right? So, you know, thinking about how circumstances like nature, you know, whether it's plague then or something now, you know, the idea that, you know, the world is actually not something we can control the way we think we can. Um, I, one of the things I love about the Jurassic Park movies, particularly the first one, is how it explores those themes of, you know, man trying to control the natural world and thinking that we can do that even though we can't, um, and mm-hmm. being constantly humbled by attempts to do that. Uh, and so I was wondering if you could speak to just how in your research or just in the book itself of how you see the, just the sheer force of nature that comes from something like a tiny germ or the human reaction of fear and superstition and stuff that it, that can be the, you know, the kind of the visceral kind of reaction to it. Um, you know, how, how did you see that whenever you're researching that book and how did you communicate that uh, in the story that you were telling there? Does that make mm, sense? There's so, yeah, so much, so much to say there. Um, so the Great Plague happened half a generation after the Great Famine which um, it was the end of the medieval warm period. And there was this period of cooling where, um, you know, caused a lot of rain, a lot of crops fell, uh, failed. And so you had an already weakened and already dwindled population, you know, that was very conscious of its mortality. And then in comes, you know, this triple strain of, of plague, you know, three different kinds of plague and just wipes out half the population. You know, and so the effect that that had was not just like, oh my gosh, my aunt died or something like that. It was like, no, like society was broken apart. You know, you, the, the workforce was cut in half. You had, you know, your communal bonds, your, your societal stability, anything like that. Even your relationship, you know, how you understood uh, the church and, you know, what you were told about well, God will protect you if you if you don't sin and stuff like that. And but but now you're noticing not just your family, but like the the Lord of the Manor, and your clergy is wiped out. And so like everyone who you thought was supposed to be more or less stable is like gone, you know. And it's no respecter of persons. And so it just it upsets the apple cart in a way that you know the your your footing is is just gone. And all that you can be sure of is that you're going to die, whether it's from the plague or it's from an accident or it's it, so death becomes like right here. It just, it becomes so present. And you see that in a lot of the art that comes out of that time, you know, about the century after the plague, there's um, this art movement or, you know, this, this theme of memento mori, you know, so a lot of skeletons, you'll see a lot of skeletons, a lot of like meditations on heaven and hell. And, it's a, a way to help people to to face facts, you know, face their own mortality and say, this is coming for all of us. You know, the, you just wiped, you just saw all these people wiped out, but it's coming for you too in one form or another. And so, um, okay. So you had this, like, after that, this, this movement of several centuries of like unbelievable scientific and artistic advances that came out of the plague directly you know, directly from the plague. You had the Renaissance, you had um, the, the Protestant Reformation, you had, in fact, the Enlightenment, okay? And what, but the thing that happened with the Enlightenment that's like maddening 
you know, that at the same time that we started to get a concept of like individual rights, you know, slavery started to be called into question, you know, all these things that had been part of humanity for time immemorial. Mm -hmm. Now we started to see them in a different light, like, oh, you know, uh, you know, the individual is important. It's not, it's not about the masses, right? But then from the enlightenment, what did you get? You get this, this uh, trope of man's triumph over nature. Like finally we can bring nature under our control, right? And then you get Marx and, um, you know, the, going, going back to this sense of the collective and, you know, the, the loss of the individual, right? So what the plague could have taught us, you know, about our own mortality and about the fleetingness of life Yes, it taught us, but then we, it's almost like we went backwards, you know, into, into a pre-plague kind of security that, you know, thinking that we could triumph over, over nature. And so here we find ourselves now in 2020 faced with this, this pandemic, right? Which is not anywhere near as virulent or as deadly, thank, you know, mostly because of modern medicine and, you know, the, the advent of hand washing and things like that. But, um, but we're, we're having to grapple with this. However, we have so much distraction that we can't touch that again. Yep. You know, like where are the artists who are creating memento mori? Hmm. All right. I want, to, I want to circle back to that because okay. it actually ties really well into so I think I showed you I have all these post-its in front of me and I only had one that was clear of where, and I had, I had one that just says, end here with, uh, <laughs> I just wrote a note about something and it kind of points up to that of kind of the, okay. so I, want, I don't, I do want to come back to that. Um, so one of the things that I had mentioned um, before we got started and you really just, what you said really beautifully kind of ties into that is the, you talked about the role of art and memento mori during that time period and so i wonder i was wondering if you could kind of speak to so your books a few through lines um is i think crisis and people responding to crisis and kind of the human reaction and human experience during crisis so you have the plague and you have a really unique character as your main character in the book and kind of personal experience there is very different than uh other people's experience and then you have the Holocaust, and then now with this other book that you're going to be working on about the Berlin Wall. Um, so we have this kind of through line of upheaval, of crisis. So I was wondering if you could speak to the the ways in which art and artists and uh, something a little bit more, uh, I guess, I don't, I don't creative is not the right word. It's really kind of clunky for what I'm trying to communicate here, but the way in which something other than just a rational, like inside the box framework has helped people process and learn from uh, these kinds of crises uh, or crises, I guess. So whether it's the plague and you just did kind of touch on that, or it's the Holocaust and World War II, or the, the Cold War and the raising of the Berlin Wall and kind of that Cold War era, but the ways in which artists have really been vital in helping people to understand and to learn from and to process um, crises and, and uh, really tragedies throughout human history. Just with those three things, you know what I'm saying? <clears throat> or, or anything else you want to talk about, but you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, we are a storytelling species, right? We, uh, we're, we're constantly calling to mind the things of the past in order to give us tools for the present and even anticipation for the future. Mm -hmm. So whether that's, you know, that, whether that's a creation myth, you know, from Mesopotamia or whether that's, um, you know, I'm, I'm, right now I'm watching a lot of East German cinema, you know, and uh, seeing what kind of stories were being told then, you know, so uh, even, even something like I'm reading the, Gul the Gulag Archipelago right now, very, very slowly and very methodically and in and amongst, you know, 30 other books that I'm reading at the same time, but... Funny. Solzhenitsyn is funny in a way that's very surprising. Yeah, you're right. I mean, he's got a quick wit. Yeah. You know, and... Um, Sorry. 
Yeah, no, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. Like, funny is not exactly the word I would, but now that you say it, I'm like, yeah, no, he's he's a ball buster. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that stories, I think any art, you know, I, okay, so getting back to like the abstract, you know, I'm, I'm not an abstract artist, right? But um, are uh, the, the abstract arts, you know, do they, do they necessarily tell stories? Yeah, some do. Um, but especially the narrative arts, okay? That's like, that's my wheelhouse, so I'm going to stick there. Those are the kinds of things that help people to call back to memory how this went before, because there's nothing new under the sun. Like everything that we're experiencing now in terms of the, the tearing apart of our, our country and our culture, and it's, it's not just like one side feels it. I mean, we all feel it. We all feel like this thing is, this thing is in trouble, okay? Thank God we have a, a few millennia now of stories that we can turn to and go, okay, I recognize this. I recognize what it looks like to see a, a country torn apart because I remember a story about a family being torn apart. And I know how that feels and I know what I learned from that. And so uh, that's essentially my story. I mean, that's, that's why I write these stories is because I grew up in a home in crisis. Like I, I grew up in a, in a home where nothing was, nothing was certain, nothing was guaranteed. It was all crisis all the time, my entire childhood. And so I emerged from that, you know, with, with a couple of tools, you know, like with a, a paintbrush and a pencil and I could do something with those. And so these are the kinds of stories that I'm attracted to. These are like when, when everything is being, when everything has gone to shit. Okay. <laughs> Sorry if I, I don't know if I can swear, but I don't usually, but that's the only way to put it. Um, then, then that, that protagonist, what tools do they have? So with what the night sings, this, this girl, this teenage girl, survives the Holocaust. The book starts on the day that she's liberated from a concentration camp. What does she have? All she knows how to do is sing and play the viola because her father gave her some skills before, you know, when, when he started to see the writing on the wall, he kind of dumped all of his knowledge into her and, and her stepmother did too, you know? And so w w of what use is a viola and some operatic arias but they wind up being exactly the tools that she needs to survive and in fact they get her they they keep her from being killed they keep her from 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 the selections and they're the things that enable her to um and whether it's just those particular skills or whether it's the memories of her father um that give her just like a sense of meaning she's able to emerge and she's able to rebuild you know, it's not just the Holocaust itself, but it's also her coming of age. It's, it's her becoming an adult without any tangible resources. So, you know, if it's a cloud of outrageous blue, I mean, this girl has nothing but synesthesia. <laughs> you know, she sees colors all the time. Like, how could that possibly be a tool? You know, there's, there are these very, like, it, it, I, I'll, I'll take it back to something that I observed when I was working on What the Night Sings which is that whenever there's um, any kind of societal upheaval, but especially if it's a, if it's a governmental, you know, if it's, if it's coming from the top, the first people to go are the artists and intellectuals. Mm -hmm. It's the, they're, they're like the first ones carted away. Okay. And, or, or censored or, um, you know, fired and things like that. And lo and behold, what do you see right now happening? tons and tons of censorship of artists and intellectuals. There are certain things that you cannot say. There's certain things you cannot write about. You're not permitted to write this story because you're not of this group, let's say. Yep. Um, that, it, it doesn't matter. Like, you know, we have this, I, I'm going off on a little tangent here, but I think it's important to say that you hear a lot of people saying, you're not being censored. You can, you know, it's just, you can't write that book. You know, the government's not telling you, you can't do that, but you just can't write that book. Yeah. Well, that's censorship. Yeah. 
whether it's coming from the government or it's coming from, you know, a, a burgeoning societal movement, who do we think the people are going to be in power that are going to then become the government that wants to, you know, that says you can't write that book or you can't, you can't do that study or, you, you know what I mean? Yep. So w these things matter. And so what artists and thinkers do and say and think about, like it, it matters and we have to fight for that. Yep. You know, because the, the things that the art, okay, bringing it back to what, where I started here was that, um, it's the it's the stories and the images and the stand up routines and the songs that artists create that give people the tools to emerge from the crisis. Yep. Yes. They're not just they're not just escape. They're not just like for me like growing up books were not an escape for me. Even my picture books, okay? Like I read a lot of fairy tales growing up and that's all I ever wanted to do was illustrate fairy tales before I started writing fiction. What did fairy tales do to me? Did they, did they teach me that I wanted to be a Disney princess and wear pretty gowns and like, you know, find the prince? No, that's people who say that kind of crap, they're missing the entire point. They're missing the entire point. These stories, these archetypical stories, these myths, these fairy tales, they are the freaking tools for survival. Yep. Yeah. That's Why don't we understand this? What's funny is you were, whenever you said, I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, but this is important. My thought was, I feel like you took a screenshot of my post-it notes. So everything you just said actually feeds <laughs> into the exact thing that I was going to, the next question I was going to ask. Um, what, whenever you were saying real fast though, that about how it's government, you know, I'm not being censored or someone says you're not being censored because the government's not doing the censoring. Well, John Stuart Mill wrote in On Liberty about how actually the most oppressive form of censorship is societal is whenever you're in a society that that discourages you from expressing yourself like that's it's way worse censorship than the and it's self censorship exactly. totally way worse um, so that that feeds into so the next question I was gonna ask you is actually about subversion and the and the role of sub, of subversion in these different crises so if you let's say you have something that's a just a, a disaster right? That's, uh, you know, like a, 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 a Pompeii, you know, kind of thing. Like you have, you know, a, a natural disaster that's not necessarily something where you, pull, you can find the, you know, show me on the map where the evil is, you know, kind of thing. Um, but it's just a thing happened. But there's also this other part where, you know, usually even within that, you see, you know, some people show their true colors and you see kind of some tyrannies and you see some atrocities. And sometimes those rise to the surface and rise to the top of the power hierarchies and so on. And like what you were just saying about how during a lot of these things, if it's a governmental upheaval kind of thing or government um, cr created crisis, when you're talking about uh, what the night sings, um, that and how they, the first people they lock up are the artists uh, is because those are the people who are most likely to, you know, employ subversion within their art in order to kind of help people to, to point to, you know, they're the canaries in the coal mine. That's what everyone has said yeah. for a long time. And I think it's still true um, because of that. So how would you see like the role of subversion within art uh, being played out throughout history? Um, and again, whether it's during the dark ages, whether it's during uh, the French revolution or, you know, actually we're going to get to that here in a little bit, but um World War II, whatever, or just anywhere you see that, like the role of subversion and, and how the artist uses that as a way to really help society get through those things. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll give you just a tangible example of this. So in World War II, there was a, there was a special place that the Nazis sent the artists and intellectuals. It was called Terezin. Hmm. It's a town about, a north, about an hour north of Prague, um, you've either call, heard it called Terezin or Theresienstadt, and it was a, a it was a garrison town. It was like a fort town. I've been there, and um, they would tell people that they were, you know, because they were the special ones. They would, you know, kind of appeal to their their intellectual pride or their artistic pride and say, "We're gonna we're gonna send you somewhere special where you can just be with people like you," and um, 
you know, it's, it's also where they sent, um, let's say, the elderly, uh, the wealthy elderly. Oh, you're going you're gonna to go to a spa town. It's going to be really comfortable for you. Um, you're going to be able to do your thing there. So they ship these, you know, artists, composers, intellectuals to Terezine. And it's a town. It, so you go there today, it's a working town. Um, it's re-inhabited. It doesn't look like a concentration camp. It looks like this charming little one-mile square town. And uh, they had a, a graphic design studio there where they would employ the artists to uh, essentially create propaganda um, or, you know, whether it was like uh, billboards about the latest building project or whether it was flyers or whatever, they, they let the artists put on plays, they let, uh, they, there were concerts, the people were starving, but they could do their art, right, in this little, con- this little controlled place. And so what the artists did in particular, the visual artists, would, was that during the day, they would work in the graphic design studio creating the propaganda to stay alive. And they would s- steal the art materials. And at night, they would go into the ghettos, the apartments, where there were 80 people crammed into a room on bunk beds, and they would draw the reality of what was going on. Or they would draw, you know, they would, they would sneak you know, and uh, create a drawing of the cart piled with bodies or, you know, and so um, there was this, this kind of double life going on. And so that's how the artists of Terezin subverted the control that was that the authorities thought they were exercising over the artists, right? I mean, in that little microcosm, um, you know, yes, the government had control over what got made, over what the artists said and did in public, but they couldn't have any control over what the artists did behind the scenes. And those drawings that these artists created, now, um, there, there are very few survivors of Terezin because it was, a, it was a way station on the way to Auschwitz. So they would ship you there. You'd, you'd spend your time there for a time, and then you'd be shipped off to Auschwitz anyway. Wow. Um, so yeah, so very, very few survivors of Terezin. And so, and these artists probably knew it. Yeah, their art you know, survived? The, like, can you find some of their art? Oh, well, yes. And that's the thing. They hid their art away. So they, they knew they would not survive, but they created the art anyway as a testament and as a witness that would outlive them. Hmm. And you can buy books. So uh, if you've ever heard of the book, um, I Never Saw Another Butterfly. Okay, so that is pretty widely available. You can get that. But there, I also have a book called The Artists of Terezin that's like, you know, big, thick book. And there are some artists who were, um, so a couple survived, but by and large, they were killed. And um, they, you know, they would hide their stacks of drawings in the walls. They were found later. Um, you know, upon excavation and things like that. So subversion, you know, there's a reason it's subversion. It's not safe. You know, there, there's a sense that you, you accept the fact that you might not outlive what you're doing. And you have to come to peace with that. How do you, you know? See- Sorry. Um, and, and I just want to say, like, uh, you- when I say outlive, I, I don't want to, I don't want to be grandiose about that either. You know, it's not just like, oh, I might get killed by the Gestapo. And so I'm going to just create my art anyway. No, I mean, it could be something as quotidian as like, well, I, I might lose my job. Yep. Um, I might be disenfranchised from my industry, but I got to tell the truth. And subversion isn't, see, okay. When you go to art school, as long as I did, <laughs> I did 10 years of art school. And there's always going to be the posers. There's always going to be, be the people that wear it on their sleeve, like, I'm an artist, you know, and they're dressed all in black and they've got, you know, and it's like the purple hair and whatever. And look, I dress in black a lot and I had the purple hair and I, okay, but, <laughs> and I have tattoos. Okay, whatever. But today I'm in a nice button down glass and my hair's done, you know. Um, it doesn't mean I'm any less subversive. 
because subversion doesn't have to do with the image that you put forth as an artist or like how, you know, how edgy you are. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with you telling the truth. That's it. Huh. Okay. So that's, that's really interesting. I like that. I like the way you just said there. Cause my next question was, so I wanted to kind of combine two things and then I've got a lot here. I don't know if we're going to get to it. Cause I had this last, this last part here and we're at about an hour, but, um, on that idea of subversion, you know, one of the things that you've talked about in some of your episodes is the difference between artistic action and activism. And yeah. one of the questions I had is, uh, and I, maybe this, well, I'll wait and see how you answer it, but um, is how you would take that and combine that with the idea of, okay, what, do you see a difference? Like, is there such a thing as negative subversion? Like, in other words, can an artist be subversive in a way that's actually like bad, that reinforces something bad or that it that introduces something um, that's negative or harmful? Like, in other words, how would you delineate out like art that is, is meaningful? Like, I know that people say like, art is subjective, all art is subjective. And, and I think, okay, there's, I, I don't think that's true, actually. It's not I true. Once, I, you know, as someone who has, really no artistic background. I once spent the majority of a friend of mine's bachelor party arguing with one of his friends that he was talking about modern art and, mm -hmm. and how it's just as good as, you know, some classical art. I said, I don't think that's true. You know, point to the modern art. Well, it depends. That, it's going to be around, you know, 1200 years from now, right? The people are going to be going from all over the world. To mm -hmm. see. But anyway, I but think there are some. Yeah. Per Go perhaps, but, I'm, but just generally speaking. And so, yeah. Um, like a banana stuck to a wall, you know, is not going to be there, you know, 1200 years from Probably now. Probably not. But, but either way, my, my point is that um, I just didn't know, you know, what are your thoughts on, is there good subversion and bad subversion? Is there, how would you differentiate that? And, you know, I, you have talked about this in some of the other episodes, but if you want to rehash some of the differences you see between artistic action and activism during those times. So in other words, I see a difference between, let's say, for example, the way in which an artist would subvert during World War II or during, you know, the Cold War, if you're in East Berlin, uh, anything like that. And if you are being subversive uh, in maybe the turn of the century, Great Britain, and, you know, you're trying to be subversive by introducing, Mar you know, Marxist doctrines and stuff like that. Um, and, and using art to introduce things that might be negative, actually, where you're, you, you see what I'm saying, where you think mm -hmm. you're the hero, but you might actually be the villain. Is there, is that oh, yeah. a, is, is that a thing that you can identify and how would you draw those lines if it's even possible? Gosh, that's really, yeah, that's tough. So, um, I mean the first thing, so I knew there would be a reason for me to pull out this book. <laughs> Soviet posters. Yep. Um, so yeah. So, so like a negative subversion, like you're talking about, I think would be like propaganda. Um, where even if you're a true believer and you're like an artist, which I mean, I would say most of them are not. Okay. <laughs> but, um, you, you know, if you're a really talented painter and you're creating like, I just, okay. So just opened up to this, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful painting, like, you know, but what is it in the service of and what story is it telling? You know, it's telling a constructed story. Um, and so you might think in creating this that you're subverting evil capitalism, but really you're just a slave to this other system, you know? So you're not really subverting anything. You're, you're reinforcing something. Yep. Um, Jonathan Pajot and I had an interesting conversation where we talked about, about propaganda and, um, and about subversion. And we were saying that, you know, he and I as like, you know, traditionally rooted, uh, you know, tellers of archetypical stories that like, we're probably the most subvers subversive movement that's going on right now, you know? Um, and I, I, you know, it feels that way. And now look, I'm not saying I'm like, oh, I'm so big and bad, you know, but I, I think that what I'm, what I'm about and the place that I'm coming from it's, it's not the, it's not the accepted, um, it's not the accepted paradigm, yep. you know, um, 
when I was coming up through school and everything, you know, it, it was it was an era of shock art, and there was a lot of a lot of that going on in the '90s um, with Andre Serrano and Maplethorpe and um, just us art students who were just trying to like, you know, it was like the age of public enemy and, you know, fight the power and stick it protest to the man rock. and all that stuff. What? Protest rock. Also. Protest rock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So exactly. So, um, but then, you know, once Coldplay came into the scene and, you know, Dave Matthews band and all that stuff, it was like that, that era was kind of over. Right. Well, and maybe that was a reaction to all this, you know, shock art and whatever, but like, okay. So there was a place for Duchamp to do the urinal, right? To do fountain. Yeah. There was a place for that. That need that probably needed to be done at the time. The banana on the wall, I'm sorry, that's over. Like that was done a hundred years ago when Duchamp put the urinal on its side. That's over. Now the the you know, so whether you want to talk about subversion or you want to talk talk about reaction to what came before, and it's almost like correction. It's like the pendulum swinging back and forth and trying to settle, you know, to some kind of middle. There are times when the artist needs to subvert by doing the fountain, the urinal. And there are times where the artist needs to subvert by doing iconography, like, you know, like literal Eastern Orthodox icons like Peugeot does. So I think that we're in one of those periods of correction where the subversion is coming from the archetypical, the archetypal. Yep. (laughs) I don't know which which form of that word to, to use, but it's from the, tradition. the traditional. Yeah, that's. Um, yeah. First off, I would recommend anyone go and check out that conversation you had with Jonathan Pajot about uh, iconoclasm and stuff, which is something we're about to talk about. Uh, yeah. but it was a super interesting interview. Um, I would argue that punk rock did continue some of that for a while after absolutely nineties. You know, um, yeah, like too, and even. Po- you know, you mentioned posers, you know, people like Good Charlotte and stuff that, you know, really it was kind of poppy punk rock, but they did, you know, it resonated with, with kids, you know, in the early yeah. 2000s, you know, teenagers and stuff, and, you know, Simple Plan, some of those kinds of bands. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I would say that the last great punk band was Weezer. After that, after Weezer. I'll think about that, but I, I was would, done. I think actually Bowling for Soup would fall into that category if you're familiar with their work. Um, I'm not. I, I think Bowling for Soup actually is is, is pretty good. But I, I like Weezer a lot. So I, would, I have yeah. a quick question that I want to jump to iconoclasm as a way to kind yeah. of bring us here, bring us home. Um, you know, on that subject of, of subversion and, and, you know, trying to figure out what, you know, what type of subversion is necessary for that moment. You know, one thing that you said in – one of your other episodes is you talked about how uh, just the process of art and you said that, um, you know, you believe something that I also believe, which is that we'll have to give an account for every careless word spoken. And so I was wondering how you take that and, you know, filter the, the necessity of art to kind of be subversive, to kind of push boundaries some um, with, while also being careful, uh, about what you're doing. Does that make sense? Like, how do you mm-hmm. uh, take those two things and kind of m- meld them together? The ideas of, I, I need to be real, I want to be careful with my words because I do think I'm going to be held to account. But also, yeah. you know, part of art is playing in the boundaries, kind of figuring out, you know, mapping the margins of what's going on in society and pushing back where needed. I like what you said there, mapping the margins. That's a good way to put it. Um, so, Mm. There's, yeah, there's a couple things I could say here. Oh, going back to your point before about artistic action versus activism. Um, if we understand two things about artists, one is that artists live on the margins. Um, that again does not mean that you're being super edgy and you're like, no, that's not it. It means that the artist does not squarely fit in any kind of camp. The the artist cannot be co-opted by ideology. And when they are, that's propaganda. Okay. Um, So artists have to be able to extract themselves from rigid ideologies and be able to 
like you said, map the margins. They're the ones that show people where the boundaries are because they don't live inside the center. They live on the outside. They live on the boundaries. And so they have to stay there. And what's, what's, happened, with, um, what, what's happened with social media and with, uh, with the internet generally is that, you know, now everybody gets to hang up their shingle, right? And so there's an awful lot of competition for attention. And there's two ways that you can get attention uh, in, this, in this sphere or in this current time. One is that you can create like the most awesome lifestyle blog, right? Where it's all about image. It's so pretty. And you, you know, you've got this like, you've got the famous agent who like puts out all of the great pretty stuff. And, you know, you're just like, it's Okay. It's the image. It's it's artist as image maker, like as as um, as decoration, right? Mm -hmm. The other way that you can get that attention is by being an activist. So you put up the correct images, the 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 approved images, the black square, you know, the whatever it is. You make sure that you do that because that's how you're going to be judged. And the second that you put that up there, everything else you do will be judged on whether you did all of the things you're married right to. whether you're married to it you you as jiminy cricket said you buttered your bread now sleep in it you know you you can't extract yourself from that so it's either it's either it's either uh, decoration or it's activism which really can be the same thing artistic action on the other hand like what i talk about on my podcast the whole the whole point about artistic action is that it is human centered it's 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 taking into account that you are a human being in a physical body in the world and that you are you have a responsibility as an artist yeah. to other people and you will have to give account like you um i get asked a lot about uh well, is it right to put this image up? Is it right to post this kind of thing? Is it right to do this? To which I almost inevitably reply, do you have a journal? Do you have a sketchbook? Did you do it there first? Like, did you do like several years of pressing out this idea in private before you put it up? I mean, most people don't. Most people don't. They, they just, they churn out you know, whether it's the decorative image or whether it's the activist image, they, they're just churning it out. It's always, you know, and there's very, very little going on behind the scenes. There's very little like hashing it out in the analog, in the day-to-day. -day. Do you know what I'm saying? Sure. Where, so, so the artistic action means that something has been like fully embodied, fully invested in and fully pressed out over a long period of time before it sees the light of day. And then when it sees the light of day, the artist is conscious of the people that are going to be interacting with it and what it's going to do to them and for them. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I will say, so I have a couple thoughts. Yeah. Real fast um, Before getting into this last part here, but I do think that some of the, there is a performative nature with some of those lifestyle blogs but I think yeah. some of them are also just, here's a thing I'm into and why not share that with people? Oh, like, sure. I have a friend who has a lifestyle blog and it's like a Midwestern lifestyle blog. And it really, mm -hmm. like, it is just her saying, here's the things that, I, that I'm doing. I'm just yeah. going to put it on video. So I, but I do think that by and large, so she's very authentic in that. Um, mm -hmm. but by and large, I think there is, you know, that, that idea of doing it for the gram and the Instagram stuff and where it's all just a performative mm -hmm. and image based thing. Um, it, you're right there. The other thought that I had whenever it comes to, you know, whenever you're talking about like a fully flushed out idea, you know, and is it something you really hammered home and, and kind of internalized, you know, before putting it out there, I do think there's room for, you know, again, just thinking about the way in which, you know, this personal experience of that some of the best pieces I've written is something that I'm laying in bed, an idea pops into my head and I'm like, I can't go back to sleep and I get up and I come in, I write it and then I put it mm -hmm. out there. Like yeah. it's now the truths or the ideas communicated are things that I have internalized that are, you know, that I think are true. It's not like I just, you know, gained some new idea or some new mm -hmm. belief structure 
and I'm putting it out there. But yeah. So the things that I might be filtering that through the ideals uh, or the ideology or whatever that I might be filtering when I'm communicating through is something that I've had for a while, probably the same way anyone's principles informs what they do and how yeah. they express themselves. But that, that piece of work itself is something that, you know, oftentimes I'll go back and read it. And I'm like, Oh my God, this is so filled with grammatical errors. This is horrible. Why didn't I proofread that? You know, but the idea, you know what I'm saying? So I think yeah. there probably is some room for, uh, Oh, yeah, let me let me just let me just address that for one second, right? So, like, there's absolutely a place for spontaneity. Spontaneity, yeah. I don't know what that was. I, that is, yeah. No, I'm not talking about like, and I don't know your friend who does the the lifestyle blog, obviously, but like, well, you personally insulted her, and you are an apology. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would venture to guess that, I mean, you know her, if you're vouching for her, then I would venture to guess, like you're saying she's authentic, then this is the way that she lives all the time. Yep. And so she just happens to be taking a picture of it. Great. Then, then for her, the spontaneity is coming from a, from a history, like a deep history and a deep groundedness that she, she know she has authority yep. and you don't get authority by taking it. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So you taking something you, in here and and expressing it, not taking it from someone else and immediately just regurgitating it. And that's exactly it. Yeah. That's, that's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. So on that note, I, I, briefly, I do want to ask you about some I iconoclasm because um, I really liked something you said, and then I want to bring it home here. Um, but whenever you were talking about iconoclasm in in one of your episodes, I can't remember. Um, you talked about how it's, it might've been the Jonathan Pajot one where you said that really iconoclasm is something you see throughout history. Um, but what you learn from it, you know, how you can kind of judge it is by what is being torn down and who is the, who is doing it. Right. And so, you know, for those who don't know, iconoclasm is when people are destroying art and iconography and, and things that, you know, point to things that are, historically rooted or maybe within the, you know, the traditions or the hierarchical structure of mm -hmm. their context. And so a question I had for you is, you know, I, I was, as I was listening to that and I was thinking about times when iconoclasm was really rampant. Um, I was doing some research on ancient Greece uh, this past spring and there was this society. I'm trying to remember what the name they're, what they're called, uh, that it started with an M, but they were like, you know, thousands of years BC. And there was this time and even in ancient Greek history where art was destroyed, books were burned and everything like that. So we don't have a lot of information about them. Um, but you saw that, you know, throughout history going up into the French Revolution, World War II even. So like I was wondering, I do have a few very small examples in mind, but by and large, whenever you see iconoclastic things happening, is that something you say is let's judge that let's wait and see kind of thing, or does it raise red flags? Like, is it, in other mm. words, is it generally a good rule of thumb? And again, I can think of some exceptions here um, to say, but, but outside of those exceptions, it's a generally good rule of thumb to say, okay, well, if we look at all of the times in history when this was taking place, like what was it to a good end? Like what good came from that? Um, and, and the exceptions that I can think of are like, okay, you know, there's that iconic, iconic image of, you know, the Iraqis pulling down the statue of Saddam Hussein. Uh, for example, you know, the Berlin Wall being destroyed is iconoclastic in, in a lot of ways. So there are mm -hmm. certainly um, things that are, I think, in history you can point to that are tied to some, uh, some larger thing. But how, how would you say we could generally gauge, you know, something that's going on in society? And this kind of leads us to our last, uh, qu my last question here. But um, whenever you look at that, is that, is that iconoclast? Basically, is that something you judge as neutral and you say, let's wait and see? Or do you generally go, okay, hold on, when this is happening, you know, there's some red flags here. And, you know, how, how do you filter that? Oof. So I was going to say at first – no, I'm not in favor of tearing down any, any image because images are, they're mile markers. They tell you, they tell you where you are in your moment in history. And, um, they also speak to your past. They, so iconoclasm is essentially an erasure of the past. 
And I think that's what you are. Okay. It, I'll give a current example right now. The Confederate statues. All right. Um, I, um, I can see the argument for taking them down. For, I, I, the thing that I think would work the best, right, is if a city was put to the vote and said, should we take down this statue of this Confederate soldier? And the city votes yes, um, and then, you know, they put it in a museum. I could, I could see that. Or they put it in the basement. I don't care. If, if, if that's what the citizenry wants and it's put to a democratic process, fine. Especially because the Confederate, you know, a lot of these statues that are in debate um, were put up after, you know, during Reconstruction, after the Civil War, they, um, or not even after the Civil War, but like Jim decades Crow and era. decades later, Crow Jim Crow era, era. Yeah. you know, um, by the United Daughters of the Confederacy and groups like that, that, you know, that were deliberately trying to rewrite the past. Yep. So they weren't just, they weren't just um, putting up statues to glorify the Old South. They were also creating textbooks, you know, to put into elementary schools. They, it was like a, it was a holistic effort, right? a holistic icon effort, not iconoclasm. And so I think that, okay, and then uh, places in the Eastern Bloc where, you know, you just had endless um, posters and statues of Lenin and Stalin or Mao. Um, when, it's, when it's cult of personality like that and when it's tyranny, um, yeah, okay. I think there's a case to be made for that. And, but what, but where it crossed the line with the Confederate statue thing was when we started getting into statues of Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, especially, and then, you know, Winston Churchill, things like that, where, you know, look, I'm, I'm perfectly aware that Winston Churchill um, was at one, on one hand, like a great hero of the war, but also treated the Indians, you know, in India, um, reprehensibly, you know, was responsible for, for horrible things there. So it's complicated. Um, but I think by and large, on balance, iconoclasm is not neutral. It's negative. Yep. Because another example from history would be Henry VIII's dissolution of the monasteries. You know, the Protestant Reformation was a decidedly iconoclastic movement Perfect. because they were, react they were reacting to the preponderance of of images in the Catholic church and they wanted to distinguish themselves as not Catholic, you know? And so, um, you know, you had Henry VIII d dissolving the monasteries, which basically means tearing them down and burning all the books, you know, so that there's like a wealth of history and information that we will never know because he destroyed it. Um, and it also ushered in, you know, 500 years of confusion for artists like, Christian artists today are, are really screwed because of the Protestant Reformation's iconoclasm because they, they never understood again since, you know, once, once art became secularized, they never understood what their place was with art. And so you have a lot of artists now who, who think they can't be, you know, um, they have to, they have to leave their faith because they can't reconcile those two. Well, that's not, that didn't come out of nowhere, yeah. you know? So I, I think that we have to recognize that we are, you know, as, as human beings, we are image making people, but the, the injunction, you know, the, the responsibility for us comes in, um, in, in asking a lot of questions about why we're making these images and who we're making them for. And, um, you know, are we making graven images? Are we making things to worship? You could say that about propaganda, or are we making things, you know, to serve hmm. and to, and to be those, those margin mappers. I really like that. That's um, one thing I thought I just had, one thing you said earlier, when you were talking about uh, how good art and even good subversion in some ways uh, is people centered. And one of the things I thought about is maybe another way of saying, of saying that is, you know, or maybe another level of that is that it's actually just truth centered and oftentimes is, yeah. truth flows out into, you know, the benefit of people in the personal. The other thing I thought right. about um, whenever you're talking about iconoclasm and just kind of the, 
so one of the things you said was that you see the solution to like the statues thing, for example, it, as being a local solution. So it's, it's will iconoclasm here serve a purpose to the people here on a local level, a, a cathartic kind of experience. And one of the thoughts that popped into my head whenever you're talking about destroying things and erasing memories, I don't know why this pop, popped into my head. I, I see so many things just through cinematic metaphor. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know why, but I was thinking about Jenny and Forrest Gump throwing rocks at the house she grew up in because her dad was abusive. And then Forrest Gump has it bulldozed for her. And that serves as a, uh, a, a very cathartic experience for her because that was mm. a, a monument to her that she had to see every day to this really painful traumatic experience she had. And so, you know, for some people, she might look at that and go, that's a testament to what I overcame. Uh, but for her, yeah. It was, this is a reminder of pain. And so, I, you know, catharsis mm. there was destroying that and saying, this is, I, I don't want this, that, that pain to be a, a part of my life anymore. Whereas again, for mm -hmm. someone else, they might go, you know, that, that standing there and, it, and it's decrepit and the paint's peeling and it's falling apart and I'm still mm -hmm. standing strong. That's a reminder that I'm still here. And that part of me is dead and gone and that it didn't beat me, you know? So people can have yeah. different interpretations of those icons um, but the solution is ultimately, you know, I think, as you said, kind of on a local level is, is what will this, what purpose will this serve for yeah. us? You know, whether it's on the individual for that particular community, you know, whether it's cathartic or if it's an erasure of the past or rewriting history, mm -hmm. um, whatever. Well, there's, there's, there's ways to tell the truth that are also peaceful. Yeah, absolutely. And there's way, there's ways to tell the truth that don't, um, that allow people to move forward without being harmed. You know, that doesn't perpetuate the harm. Yeah. You know, um, so the Berlin Wall is, is a great example of that. Um, that, that really was a, a mm, yeah, I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to leave it there because I, I should, I need to think about that more. That's a really, it's a really good thought. So, okay, cool. So uh, that's. I'm interested to, as you tease that out, I want to know where, where you land. Um, yeah. So one of the things that, you know, to kind of bring it to a close here uh, is you mentioned, you know, you kind of touched on it earlier. You just brought it up. Um, I think maybe you did. I don't know, but you've done it in other episodes, podcasts that you've done. So you talked about the hero's journey and I really love the hero's journey as a storytelling element. Uh, one of my favorite like writers who makes you know TV shows, now is a guy named Dan Harmon. I don't know if you know who Dan Harmon is, but he no. he did a show. He's a, he does comedy, but he also is an incredibly deep thinker. Um, like he does a whole a podcast where they do like Dungeons and Dragons and stuff. But he did like the show Community. I don't know if you've ever seen Community. Is an incredibly no. unique uh, show. It's super funny, and he's also the guy who uh, is one of the writers of Rick and Morty. If you're familiar with that show now, um, which is you know it's a silly kind of show, but it has a lot of really interesting kind of existential questions that it teases out uh, but he's a big fan of the hero's journey and one of the things that he likes about it is that it's it's really the kind of the perfect um narrative machine for television because your protagonist it's because it's cyclical right and so yeah. they they end kind of where they started and so you can just keep retelling that uh that story in a lot of different ways mm. you know there's different journeys heroes go on you know, there's mm -hmm. a reason why there's multiple Sherlock Holmes books and Hardy Boys, you know, and so on and so forth. James Bond movies, um, the heroes can have multiple journeys. And so one of the things you said in an episode, um, I think it might have been the one where you're talking about the kind of refining process was that um, completed does not equal finished, right? And it, just because yeah. something, you know, you might say, I, this is this part's complete doesn't mean it's actually finished. And I think that uh, flows really beautifully into the idea of the hero's journey. And so the question I wanted to ask you, and, you know, earlier at the very beginning, we were talking about the plague and you were saying, you know, you would have hoped that they would have learned these certain things, but instead they drew entirely wrong conclusions and you brought it back to today. Uh, I wanted to ask you, you know, where do you see, you know, us, you know, as you know, whether it's the West or humanity, like what stage of the hero's journey do you see us being on right now uh, in history, you know, considering that it is cyclical and there are these times, you know, there's that saying, mm -hmm. uh, b bad times, you know, create good men, good men create good times, good times create weak men, weak men create bad times. And, you know, it's, it, that's kind of another yeah. way of, of, of 
you know, explain that same kind of idea, but where do you see us on the hero's journey right now? And for anyone who doesn't know, maybe explain a little bit of, of the hero's journey itself, but uh, yeah, it's kind mm. of... I mean, there are people who could describe the hero's journey a lot better than I could, but it's, it's essentially, I mean, so I think of the, um, I think of the fairy tale, the golden goose. So there's, uh, there's three brothers and I mean, this is so typical. There's three brothers and the, the two eldest are like, you know, thought to be the ones that are, you know, most likely to succeed. Right. And some challenge comes up and you know, the eldest brother fails in some way, gives up too early, you know, figures it's not worth his time, goes back home or he's killed or whatever. Then it comes to the second brother, same thing. And then finally, it's like, it's the little brother out in the backyard, you know, who's uh, the last one left, you know, and has to go and and, uh, go on this adventure, you know, to retrieve some kind of impossible goal, you know. So Nicholas Kotar, by the way, um, has a great new podcast. Uh, gosh, the name is escaping me at the moment. But if you just look up Nicholas Kotar, um, where he's uh, analyzing Slavic fairy tales. And so, you know, this kind of thing comes up all the time. So, you know, the, it's the weakest brother. It's the, it's the one le- least likely to succeed, the one everybody ignores, who is then going to go and undertake the perilous journey. And... Um, you know, he doesn't just do it for himself. It's, it's almost always in the service of something greater. Maybe it's, maybe it's an errand for the king. Maybe it's, um, he's got to save, you know, his village from destruction, something like that. And he's got to go through this perilous journey. And um, he's got to go to the very, very lowest place mm-hmm. before he can emerge. So, you know, Jordan Peterson talks about Pinocchio going into the belly of the whale to rescue his father, you know. It's that, it's that kind of thing. And, you know, and the, the hero emerges from that with more resilience, more authenticity. He's more real, um, like literally more real, more, um, yeah, solidified and, um, winds up creating something, you know, bringing, bringing a Renaissance basically back to the place where he started. Yeah. Does that make sense? So if I, if I had to say, you know, where we are in that, I think that um, (laughs) one thing you could say is that American democracy being the elder brother or the middle brother or something like that is uh, maybe 20th century democracy has perhaps failed, perhaps produced um, maybe given up too easily produced a, a something that's strong on the outside and weak on the inside doesn't have the resilience you know to follow through and we're we're waiting for the emergence of the um the younger brother i think hmm. uh, the the way i conceptualize it is usually that there's you have your hero and they're at rest but they want something and they go after it and it has a cost yeah and then they deal with the consequences of that cost and in the process Mm -hmm. of dealing and that's kind of low point in the process of dealing the consequences of that cost and the way they went about trying to obtain it they learn something Mm -hmm. and then the process of learning something helps them overcome yeah the you know the the price or the mistake or whatever Mm -hmm. Um, and then it brings them full and that's why it's a hero's journey what makes them heroic is that they do emerge They do emerge and that they do learn something Mm -hmm. and then they, you know, resume where they started at their kind of state of rest, but they're better for it. Right. So I guess I, I, I agree with you. I think that there's the, it seems like right now we're at a place where we're dealing with um, the, the costs there's, there's costs to things that we want and there's different people that are seeing the costs of what they want, whether it's, Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm not going to get into specifics, but I think that we're in a place right now where yeah. we're dealing with uh, with that and that hopefully starting to come uh, up from that low point, or maybe we're not there yet, uh, but to where there's that learning that takes place. Um, yeah, I, I wish I had your optimism. <laughs> I, I think well, we I ha- don't. I'm not. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not. 
but not optimistic at all. But um, no. Anyway, Neither all right. So so that that was really interesting. Uh, you know, we've we went a little longer, I think, than than what we had planned on. But I thought that was good. Is there anything else? Any thoughts you have, kind of closing us out here? Um, you know, whether it's about I know you know we really didn't talk about your book too much, so I apologize mm-hmm. if there's you know something you wanted. That's to, okay. Um, to bring up there, or you know, talk about where people can kind of find you on your various. Uh, whether it's social media or whatever. Um, but yeah. Bring it home. Well, I'll give a plug. I'll give a plug for the book and just say that in the year of COVID um, authors really, really need support. And, you know, those of us who have had books come out this year are in a, we are in a wandering wasteland wondering, <laughs> like it's just very hard to gauge how the book is doing. And, you know, if, are, are people connecting to it? Are people reading reading it, you know, um, and so I've gotten a lot of really wonderful, you know, letters and DMs and emails from people who are reading it. Um, and I, I love those discussions. I, I love to know that it's helping people. It is a book about pandemic and, you know, the effects of pandemic on, on this, the society's psychology. Um, and I think it can offer some, some helpful tools and, and hope for people. Um, you know, I think it is a story about resilience and emergence and things like that. So you can get A Cloud of Outrageous Blue, you know, wherever you buy books. I really encourage people to support their local indie bookstores because those guys need help too. Um, and even if they don't have it on the shelves, you can order it through them. They still get, you know, a bump from that. So that would be really, really helpful. You can follow me on Instagram. I'm at Vesper Illustration. So, and that's also my website. So that's, you know, pretty easy to find. Um, but I also, I love to engage people, whether it's on Instagram or on my locals, which is vesperisms.locals.com, my think spot. Um, but yeah, and if you're looking for a, a podcast, you know, you can come and listen to Vesperisms. They're just my musings on what it, how I'm processing the world as an artist. Um, I'm trying to help people to disengage from the political worldview being the primary lens through which we see things and to kind of come back to um, a way of seeing the world that is, you know, open to possibility and, but also, you know, really seeks truth and things like that. So that's what I'm about these days. That's cool. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. I would encourage everyone to check all those things out. I really like your Vesperisms podcast. And uh, for those who aren't familiar, you know, locals is, I mean, as a, plug before Kevin has a locals engineering politics you know we talk I've got a locals Vesper has a locals so it really is a kind of eclectic and robust kind of community of people who are just you know putting their stuff out there Vesper does some really interesting things on her locals you know you guys did a you did a bake along that was on Instagram but you put the <laughs> everything I think on. we'll do one of those on on locals too yeah uh, yeah they need to get live streaming up on that um mm-hmm. sooner than later but she does that. She's done some like, you know, watching, we watched a, a Twilight Zone episode a few weeks ago. I think there's a movie mm-hmm. tonight. Uh, yep. and so it's a real, I'd really encourage people to go and check that out. Uh, check out her locals community. It's really kind of fun. And her podcast is, Vesper has a really good way of, you know, uh, hopefully uh, as you guys could tell from just listening to this, of communicating ideas that are incredibly engaging. You know, I, I think I told you that the one of the last ones you did, I was kind of fiddling around. I had the computer in the kitchen and I was, you know, making some stuff. And within maybe a minute or so, I was like leaning on the refrigerator. (laughs) Wow. Thank you. Engaging. Um, Anyway, so thanks everyone for watching. If this kind of thing you're into, please check out Vesper. I'm going to put links to all of her stuff in the description and the comments, everything like that. Um, For me, you can follow me on Twitter. That's at my mundane mind. Come to my locals, return to reason locals.com youtube return to reason think spot as well although i need to get all my stuff updated on there spotify um medium i write some articles i put an article out yesterday uh, about how screwed we are um <laughs> go and check out my uh my cynical uh bull crap so anyway all right that's it vesper thank you so much i'm going to stop recording uh now but i've really enjoyed this we didn't even get to lenses or anything like that so we'll have to <laughs> but yeah thanks. thanks truman all right